ti introduco io due minuti. Se tu sei pronto, cominciamo. Ok, we can start. Good afternoon and welcome to the last event of this year's series on Italian fashion. It's been quite a ride. Uh, we had a couple of lectures in the fall dedicated to fashion in the Renaissance, and this spring instead we dealt with modern Italian fashion. In the last talk, we explored the connections of Italian fashion, cinema, and feminism in the 20th century. And in our chat tonight, we'll discuss about Italian fashion in the 21st century, and about the elements and keys that make the Italian system and, si and style so successful throughout the world. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having an important actor in the contemporary fashion scene who can allow us to gain a more nuanced overview of this complex world which sits at the crossroads of culture, artisanship, business, logistics, and entrepreneurship. Nicola Guerini, who is here with us tonight, is a professor at Bocconi University, which is Milan's top business school, and the director of the Milano Fashion Institute, which is a very interesting reality, uh, which I encourage you to consider for your postgraduate studies if you're seriously interested in fashion. The Milano Fashion Institute combines faculty from Cattolica University, so humanities, Bocconi University, business school, and the Polytechnic of Milan, so engineers. Professor Guerini teaches management and technology in the fashion industry, both at Bocconi and at IES, which is our partner school in Milan. So for those of you who are planning to study abroad in Milan, you will have a chance to maybe take his courses and this might be another occasion to continue the conversation about fashion that we'll start tonight. What we'll do tonight is a little different from the other lectures. Given the very contemporary subject of the talk, so fashion as it is today, we agreed to divide the lecture in two parts. So in the first half, Nicola will give an overview of the Italian fashion system. And in the second, he will respond to some of your questions that we gathered over the past few weeks. In order for us to cover as many topics as possible and give an order to our conversation, I grouped your question in a few pools, uh, which I will voice for, for all. If there is time in the last minutes, we'll, we'll still have the possibility of uh, continuing the chat. And you can ask Professor Guerini the questions that were left unanswered. Let me add a caveat here. Keep in mind that to cover all the fascinating topics that you suggested, will probably require us a dozen similar events or a month-long seminar. So the purpose of tonight's event is really to start a conversation about the topic, which I hope you can continue after the lecture at IES or at the Milano Fashion Institute. As you can see, tonight's theme intersects many different subjects and realities, and for this reason, not only reflects very well the idea behind the series, so to connect through Italian culture many different words and medias. But it also concludes it befittingly, introducing us to a different and more nuanced understanding of the present from both a local and a global perspective. My thanks for making this series possible goes to Richard and Marianne Francisco, who generously supported this initiative over the years, to the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures my colleague in Art History, Tim McCall, who helped me design this year's edition, uh, to my colleagues in Italian Studies uh, for the constant support, and of course, to all of you for attending these events and making them uh, come alive. So the videos of each, le of each lectures are uh, available online at the webpage of Italian Studies at Villanova. Uh, Dr. Guerini's talk tonight is entitled A Conversation About the Italian Fashion System and I look forward to hearing more from you. And thank you very much for being here at Villanova with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you and to Professor Luca Cotini for this uh, invite. Really much appreciated. Well, it's a very tough working choice uh, trying to sum up uh, the not just the history, but basically the uh, main shapes that the Italian fashion industry has nowadays in just half an hour considering that it's one of the most important industries uh, from uh, uh, inside our territory. But we can start saying that everything started 
uh, during the 20th century in a very precise historical moment that is the one after World War II. A moment, uh, a period, an historical period that was characterized by the booming of the economy from one side, but on the other side, uh, uh, something very challenging for the Italian fashion that was the fact that back in that period you had just one epicenter on a global scale and that epicenter was Paris with a very particular product, uh, fashion product, that was the one of haute couture. So we are talking about uh, handmade products made to measure one per one client. Well, they were uh, definitely the epitome of luxury, they were almost like art, but on the other side they had a sort of a very tough boundary. You couldn't replicate in serious that kind of work. The problem is you can't properly build an industry address to the big part of the market out of that. And that's the reason why, back in 1952, there was an insightful uh, man, an Italian man, Giovanni Battista Giorgini, whose family belonging to a noble family from Florence, he was a Marchese, he was already in business uh, on totally different kinds of industry, in particular with the United States, and basically after the crisis uh, of 1929, he had, in which he had some troubles from a financial point of view, he had to rediscover a way for building new businesses. And he understood first in Italy that there could be a potential also for something very Italian, something based on artisanship, craftsmanship and the concept <coughs> of beauty. Uh, that the attention to detail that artisans were able to deliver could leverage, that was fashion. So, 1952 was a very particular year, because in that year, that person was able to create the very first uh, Italian fashion show, called The Italian Look, that was exactly shown uh, at Palazzo Pitti, one of the most beautiful monuments in Italy, with a precise scope <laughs> to show Italian excellence uh, of fashion to an international audience. And he was uh, so insightful as a businessman that he was able to have inside the audience buyers, uh, for example, uh, from Bergdorf, uh, as well as Harper Bazaars, uh, and Los Angeles Times uh, that at back at the period they had a huge mediatic attention and they were the real influencers inside uh, the American market and this permitted the person uh, to show the excellence of made in Italy but at the same time showing something different from French fashion. The insightful choice uh, by uh, Giovanni Battista Giorgini was the one to propose calendars uh, in a different way from the French one, more aligned to the needs of the American retail system. And since uh, this beginning, we can already find some of the features of uh, Italian fashion. Market sensitiveness from one side, but at the same time innovation. Understanding and anticipating at the same time uh, the needs of uh, the market. This was a sort of uh, revolution because for the first time uh, this permitted to have an international audience that started by the way from the United States uh, that permitted the creation of uh, a very solid perception. Fashion is no more just a French business, uh, fashion uh, is also an Italian business. And this is not only for women's wear, there is even a strong tradition in tailors and tailoring by uh, Italian small workshops that typically between the 50s and the 60s understood the potential of creating serious productions. 
we had the luck to have companies like uh, GFT who innovated also in terms of business models. Entrepreneurs, so not designers, that understood the potential of having their own brands as well as being subcontractor for someone else. This is a business innovation that was funding the basis for the development of the Italian fashion between the 70s and later in the 80s. But this system has a huge competitive advantage that was and is even nowadays the system of industrial districts. This is an Italian specificity, not just for the fashion industry, it is characterizing also other industries, and it's the, the phenomenon by which we have inside a specific and concentrated territory the whole supply chain of a product or a product category. What does it mean? Huge positive spillovers. You have small companies, you have family businesses, so there is a sort of uh, network of uh, tacit knowledge uh, who in informal knowledge transfer who is adding value to uh, the system. Typically you can rely on a very qualified workforce uh, because people are inside the territory with a strong specialization on that product. But also if you think back at the period in which fashion developed uh, 50s and, 50s and 60s, uh, we have to consider that IT and communication technology wasn't uh, like nowadays. So every kind of communication and the meaning of distances was totally different. One of the most important uh, uh, factors of the Italian fashion industry is that it is the longest pipeline in the world. Meaning that inside the country, a person who want, who want to do a business uh, can rely from yarn to fabrics uh, to the façon, who is the term uh, meaning uh, the manufacturing phase of uh, the product uh, up to the retail system. And this is a competitive advantage that is not so easy to replicate uh, artificially by z from zero in other kinds of uh, context. This system permitted uh, back in uh, the 80s, uh, the emergence uh, of uh, and the success uh, of the made in Italy. The 80s has been probably the golden decade uh, of fashion for one reason. Designers started to be well known uh, all over the world on an international scale. Why? Because these designers, this is a very old picture with uh, uh, the most important Italian designers. You can see a very young Gianfranco Ferré, uh, Giorgio Armani, Walter Albini, Crizia, Luciano Soprani. All of them started thanks to the support of entrepreneurs that believed in the skills and in the creativity of totally unknown designers who didn't have the proper financial means, they didn't have companies, they started putting uh, their creativity at service of uh, these companies. Two different roles, from one side, insightful uh, entrepreneurs that understood that the future could be improved uh, and innovated thanks to the support of uh, very young uh, designers. And fashion started to be linked to lifestyle. One of the most uh, successful uh, back in the 80s has been Giorgio Armani and the success of Giorgio Armani is also linked to the ability of uh, catching uh, social trends inside the society. The 80s, uh, the last part of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s, is a period characterized by women starting going uh, work, so the social role of women is uh, codified, started to be active inside the job environment. That's the reason why they needed uh, dresses that permitted them to feel empowered. That's the reason why, if you look at the aesthetics of uh, Giorgio Armani, jackets uh, are very for women's wear, are very masculine. 
with very structured shoulders, uh, with coats in terms of colors uh, and stylistic coats that recall immediately a sort of uh, empowering role of uh, dresses. If uh, women start to have the same role of men inside job environment, they need to dress uh, the same way, showing the same level of uh, uh, power. By the way, uh, Giorgio Armani is also linked uh, since the beginning to your city, to the city of uh, uh, Philadelphia, thanks also to one of the most uh, famous models that in, the, in that period uh, was uh, uh, a brand ambassador, uh, Gia Carangi. Uh, the model was originally from Philadelphia and she became really the face of uh, uh, Giorgio Armani creations back in that uh, period. But on, the second, uh, on a second step, uh, Fashion is going back, moving to lifestyle as well. Because uh, one of the key success factors of uh, Italian fashion has been the ability not just uh, to promote uh, an aesthetic related to apparel and accessories, but to promote, to identify and promote specific uh, values uh, inside a set of uh, a value system. That's the case of Gianni Versace. Of course, uh, he started uh, with uh, ready-to-wear collections and diffusion collections inside uh, apparel and accessories, but he understood that his vision, uh, based on uh, stylistic quotes uh, of the ancient Magna Grecia, Reggio Calabria Civi, so the epitome of uh, classicism and a Mediterranean reinterpretation of the artistic legacy, could be widespread even uh, inside furniture, interiors uh, and uh, even experiences when uh, uh, he was, by the way, the very first one to open uh, a branded fashion resort at the beginning of uh, uh, the 90s. If we have to sum up uh, everything inside a unique recipe, we can say that the success of the Made in Italy has been designed around three elements. First of all, creativity and design. Without that, of course, fashion couldn't exist. But along with that, the very strong support of the manufacturing system, the whole pipeline, starting from entrepreneurs up to all the players uh, inside the different steps uh, that back in the period believed uh, thanks to their lean approach, thanks to their small and medium dimensions uh, into the creative efforts of uh, designers. And then last but not least also managerial efforts. We're now talking uh, about art, we are talking about uh, something that is inside the big umbrella of business as well. That's the reason why the management of these processes uh, for nurturing the economic and financial sustainability but also the long-term vision of these companies is uh, crucial. And even nowadays, if we consider the most important Italian fishing companies, we can find that uh, at the top of the company there is always this duo between uh, one person who is in charge of the business administration uh, and another person at the same level who is in charge of uh, the creative direction, like in the case of uh, uh, Prada Group, uh, in which you have uh, Patrizio Bertelli who is in charge of uh, the administration and on the other side you have uh, Miuccio Prada who is uh, creative director of uh, the company. So, Managing uh, this kind of complexity that requires different players, some of them internal to the company, some others are not internal with different processes, require definitely a specific uh, set of uh, competences that should be based on a sort of multidisciplinary approach. The real nowadays success factor is when you have managers that know very well the fashion products as well as designers that are able to 
understand uh, and creative people that are able to understand the specificities of uh, the business uh, in which they are set. Typically, this is for showing you a representation of the main three processes that characterize fashion companies. Uh, the one of uh, product creation and development on different steps, the one of uh, communication planning and management, uh, and finally the one of business management uh, and retail. All of this do share one very important common function uh, that is the one, and senior by the way, that is the one of uh, brand management. And for all of these steps, uh, there are very specific professions that uh, make us understand that fashion is not just uh, a duo between a creative uh, person and a manager, but several professionals uh, from merchandisers uh, to brand managers uh, to even trend researchers and so on are working inside uh, very specific and codified uh, aspects uh, in order to deliver a fashion collection. Let's talk about numbers uh, as well. Uh, unfortunately, I permit to say that uh, the fashion industry doesn't catch sufficient attention by our governments that probably don't recognize uh, so much uh, all the positive externalities that fashion uh, and the fashion industry realize, not just in terms of uh, direct and indirect occupation, but also in terms of uh, country, image, uh, social values, uh, national values as well, um, and cultural values. During the last uh, years, in uh, 2017, the last in for which there are the consumptive data, overall uh, the three main uh, industries composing the fashion system, uh, textile apparel, uh, leather goods uh, and uh, footwear, add a uh, turnover approximately of 60 billion uh, of euro inside Italy. This uh, is just a part uh, of the bigger fashion system if we put also accessories, uh, for example, eyewear, jewelry and other accessory for the person and we can reach 95 billion of direct production given by the system. But the most important data comes exactly from this, the trade balance that could be considered even a proxy for the value creation by an industry inside a country and we can see that just by these three, so textile apparel, uh, footwear and leather goods, uh, we reach 18 billion euro out of uh, 47, that is the total Italian trade balance. So more than 30% of the Italian trade balance, uh, the positive trade balance, is given just by the fashion industry. That employs nowadays more than half a million people just concerning the direct uh, employment uh, without the supporting services of uh, the industry. And along with that, uh, we can see that there is uh, also, we are, uh, as Italian, we are very ambitious on average and uh, we are also envisioning new leverages of innovation, among which setting up our system uh, that is not addressed just to a specific market but on a global scale. That's the reason why, for example, some of our brands are opening uh, to, to different uh, cultures, even in terms of uh, dressing style. This is an example by Dolce Gabbana that realized the very first hijab collection dedicated to Muslim women that feel more comfortable and probably they feel uh, better using uh, a different uh, aesthetic coat but before Dolce Gabbana no one for example inside the western world considered this very important uh, opportunity or as well extend into different product categories when for example Prada Group bought Marchesi an historical uh, 
coffee shop in uh, Milano, they had and they are carrying out a very insightful plans of expansion for delivering uh, on a global scale uh, something that is very Italian in a certain way related to fine food but also related to the retail experience inside uh, the food industry that uh, you can design for a global customer and that has become one of the grow leverage for the future as well as uh, a uh, very important uh, leverage of innovation uh, that is behind the curtain, so it's inside the pipeline. Uh, it's not by random that even international brands or French brands, that's the case of Louis Vuitton, set up big facilities for the production in particular of footwear. It's not a matter of uh, labor cost, uh, we know that approximately labor costs all over Western Europe are the same, uh, what makes the difference is the fact that uh, you can rely on a set of very precise and codified manufacturing skills uh, that are not present uh, in other contexts and is not possible to replicate and this is the reason why the made in Italy system uh, can be considered even nowadays so unique. In front of that there are also new challenges of course uh, one of the most recent uh, is the one of a phenomenon that has been called see now by now i don't know if you are familiar with this term so it's a new business logic typically inside the ready to wear segment uh, the product development process is very long for creating and delivering to the market a collection we do need approximately a couple of years it's a very long process due to a very strong research. Well, this is also a system based on a very particular concept that is the one of make to order. I present a collection inside a fashion show, typically to buyers. I collect orders, I put in production what gets the sufficient number of orders. So it's also a matter of risk management, of course. But on the other side, the customer nowadays is changed. We want everything and we want everything right now, thanks also to the role of social media. So some companies like Prada, the first one in 2016, understood that there is a potential. Presenting something during a fashion show, making it available the day after inside the stores. It's a totally turn a total turnaround uh, of all the operations uh, that are needed uh, for creating that product uh, that is putting a question mark into the current uh, operational logics of uh, the system. Along with that we are seeing also a market that has changed. One of the successes of the Made in Italy starting from the 80s has been the ability of those brands like Armani, uh, Versace, Dolce & Gabbana and several others uh, to create so-called diffusion lines. More affordable, inspired from a stylistic point of view from the ready-to-wear line, but able to reach definitely a broader audience. The problem is that nowadays the market has totally changed and due to that the customer is no more so happy let's say to be addressed through that specific offer system more and more companies are rethinking strategically their diffusion lines some of them have been cancelled some others are being totally uh, redesigned but this as well has implied an opportunity for re thinking strategically business models uh, of uh, the fashion uh, companies as well as the new role of uh, retail once upon a time uh, retail was associated to convenience nowadays probably convenience is associated to smartphone in our hands uh, and in a few seconds we are able to get almost everything delivered to our home well, if convenience uh, is no more a key pillar of retail, uh, brands must rediscover 
the reasons why to invest and how to make people visit the store. That's the reason why more and more stores uh, are going uh, into an experiential uh, providing uh, function. They are becoming more and more experiential apps that permit persons uh, to get something that we can't feel uh, through smartphone. That's the case, for example, of uh, Gucci. This is uh, uh, one of the most innovative uh, uh, stores uh, they designed and opened the last year, Gucci uh, Worcester in New York City, in which they even open uh, a theater inside. Or even uh, online retailer, that's the case of uh, Sense, a Canadian uh, uh, very important uh, retailer, that uh, from being an online player decided uh, to move uh, into the offline business as well in order to provide uh, an experience uh, to their clients and that's the reason why in occasion of uh, even uh, the opening uh, they realize also multi-disciplinary uh, in a certain way projects when they launch their a uh, new flagship store in Montreal, they were able to realize a capsule collection of uh, some t-shirts with uh, Prada, promoted to, through an artistic performance by a singer, Arca, inspired by the instinct and tornado uh, in a very provocative way in order to show the union between something that nowadays has no more fixed boundary given by a specific product category and that is becoming more and more a hybrid uh, industry based not just of course on business but also on artistic inspirations and uh, different uh, collaborations. As well as, to conclude, the main evolution into lifestyle. One of the key success factors of the Made in Italy, besides the pipeline and besides creativity of the designers, has been the ability to build a set of uh, intangible values that can be stretched across different um, categories. So, we don't have to be surprised if we are in front of cases like the one of Bulgari, originally a high jewelry maker who opened even a chocolate shop uh, in Tokyo selling uh, Bulgari chocolates uh, with uh, uh, a very strong and well-defined inspiration uh, by the Italian lifestyle. And this is the reason why more and more the fashion industry has become nowadays a meta industry in which I do believe that in the future the main leverages for the growth will arrive from what originally was a little bit outside fashion so it's a matter of the design system as well as the experience system based on different industries and different uh, products uh, as well. I know that there are already some uh, questions, uh, so don't waste time and let's start let's with start our conversation. <laughs> our conversation, Luca. Thank you for the presentation and uh, <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll, I'll read some of the questions that you asked. Uh, we kind of uh, ordered them uh, in pools. So the first one is, is this. Uh, what influences modern trends? Uh, who decides what is style and what is not? And above all, what are the main influences on, in, on Italian contemporary fashion? Well, first of all, we have to, say, to see that and to say that the assumption that designers uh, are creating trends uh, is not sufficient for explaining uh, what is trend and what is style. There is a system of players, even for trend setting, that are widespread in the whole pipeline. So one of the most important uh, players is the one of uh, the, set, the system of cool hunters and the so-called bureau de style. It's a French word for meaning uh, 
uh, stylistic offices, uh, agencies. They are consultancy agencies who are able to translate some emerging trends that they are able to catch, for example, in specific locations all over the world. So it could be in Seoul, could be in Bangkok, could be in New York and to translate them into very precise guidelines uh, for product development. So this is very, uh, for example, common and easy to understand when we are seeing, for example, inside of Fashion Week uh, that all the main brands uh, are adopting a specific trend. It's not by random that they are doing that. It's sharing uh, this work by consultancy agency. As well as, for example, the research that is done by suppliers of textile. There are, for example, fairs dedicated to textiles and materials in which important textile producers are sharing and doing a sort of lobbying for promoting some of the trends. Last step in the final part of the pipeline we have to consider as well influencers. Once the product has been created, of course, there is a very important role by the uh, editorial system. There is an important role by influencers as well that through adoptions or through editorials and press coverage are able to promote to the final client a specific product. So that's for saying that it's not just by the creativity of the designer, but once again, there is a system of professions and managerial roles that are involved into that. Thank you. And some of you talked about the issue of the Versace brand that is being recently acquired by Michael Kors. And uh, the question is like, how do we define fashion uh, in such a global marketplace? And how do we define an Italian brand uh, when uh, the Italian brand operates at, a at such a global level? Well, I do believe that uh, this is one of the most important um, issues for the Italian fashion system. It's not the first case. Uh, there are several brands that in the last years have been acquired by the so-called French conglomerates. So Albemarche are caring groups uh, uh, that are able, from a financial point of view, to buy even very big companies and then to manage inside a portfolio of uh, fashion and luxury uh, companies. It's very difficult to define if, for example, this could have good or negative impacts uh, because from one side you can nurture in a faster way the growth of this company. On the other side, we have to always recognize to the fact that the specificities of these companies has been the ability to work inside uh, the Italian pipeline. I don't see uh, personally that this could be per se a uh, threat because in, you can on one side enhance uh, the international presence uh, of uh, a company but on the other side there are very precise rules in terms of uh, for example stylistic independence uh, that you have to ensure as well as avoiding to uh, carry out some action for example for savings and cost uh, that could imply some consequences in terms of uh, uh, product uh, uh, development. And following up on this question, um, what are in your opinions the similarities and what are the differences between the Italian fashion system and the American fashion system? Well it depends from the perspective. If we look from a let's say corporate point of view and brand point of view we can say that uh, on average American brands are more based on uh, as a key success factor on branding. We're talking about, in most of the cases, uh, basic uh, sportswear products uh, with a huge investment in terms of marketing and the communication process that permits them to reach uh, a global scale. While in the case of uh, Italian brands, typically the starting point uh, was a little bit a more sophisticated product uh, inspired uh, by the French haute couture while uh, uh, having more advantages in terms of being more wearable, for example. And uh, the key success factor is uh, on the manufacturing process. If we are in front of a complex uh, product to be carried out, we need a very skilled uh, uh, pipeline. While uh, if we're talking about, for example, jeanswear, 
for the nature of the product it's a little bit simpler so it doesn't matter so much where you are producing it what it matters is the system of value that you are able to associate then of course there could be even differences in terms of uh, markets uh, even if uh, we are nowadays in very complex markets so it's very difficult also to define an Italian market an American market mm -hmm. in which of course uh, there is a huge presence of uh, for example tourist flows uh, or minorities with uh, strong specificities so it's really I don't think that nowadays defining in particular uh, an American market or an Italian market could be a driver for uh, defining some strategies. Mm -hmm. So who are in your opinion the main figures, protagonists or trendsetters in, uh, in Italian contemporary fashion? Well, in my opinion nowadays the most important uh, figures uh, are the one of artisans. Of course it's a system based on uh, designers uh, and creative directors. Uh, they can come from all over the world, uh, they are coming from all over the world and they are crucial. But without the skills and the ability to nurture even uh, and to manage the generational issue that is related uh, to these particular abilities uh, that in most of the cases are even not codified, uh, well, we couldn't have the success of uh, uh, Made in Italy and uh, the ability to produce products that in some cases uh, requires uh, dozens of hours for being uh, carried out. Mm -hmm. And the last question before I open it up, open the floor to anyone uh, who might be interested to ask um, anything in particular. Uh, some of you, uh, of you asked, um, what attracted you to fashion? And what are the opportunities that are uh, there, like especially in the Italian fashion industry? And if you could say something also about the Milano Fashion Institute and how this fits sure. into uh, the game. <laughs> I do believe that one of the most compelling aspects of fashion is uh, the degree of diversity that is always an intellectual challenge that you have to face. So if we have to reduce everything, managers with designers with different logic, with different mindsets uh, that have to share in any case uh, common projects uh, in an unusual way and also the level of change. Uh, there is no other industry in the world that changes constantly the offer system uh, every six months or if you think about fast fashion even every a couple of weeks. There is no. They have a portfolio of products, uh, they have a uh, uh, an offer system that is stable for two, three, four, five years. While in fashion, everything must change so rapidly that it's also a sort of challenge that uh, we must be able to, uh, to manage. And this is something that uh, for me represents one of the most uh, beautiful aspects because uh, every day you can have a uh, new energy for creating something new if you want to work inside fashion. What is important, however, for having an opportunity is to be very well specialized. So the very first step, if there is anyone who want to join uh, the uh, fashion system is, first of all, uh, well, a very, it's a funny premise, but uh, it's something always useful to remind that uh, working inside fashion is not like going shopping. So it's normal that we like to go shopping, but working in fashion requires huge amount of energy seven days of work out of seven in some cases uh, and you don't have to look at the watch for the entry and the exit timing because uh, processes are not waiting for your timing but you must work for delivering a collection or a communication strategy on the other side it's very important to know very well uh, the process uh, you want to do when you understand that maybe your future is inside uh, merchandising is being a line builder is being a, a CRM manager then you have the possibility to build the professional skills uh, that are needed for that process because from one side fashion is compelling because it's so fast but on the other side if everything is running so fast uh, people inside companies don't have so much time for training uh, talents that's the reason why they do prefer typically persons that already have a, a professionalized education and training because they already know the alphabet, 
they already know the process uh, and this is definitely a competitive edge when they want to enter the job market. <coughs> and maybe if you want to, uh, maybe we can leave it for later if you want to show the, the video that you want sure. to about the Milano Fashion Institute, which I think fits very well into the narrative of many different uh, skill sets uh, that are Yes. And in the meantime, uh, if there is any one of you who is thinking of any particular question, uh, well, otherwise you can pull it up. One, uh, I do have a oh. question, actually. So um, one thread that we've seen throughout the lectures this year that I thought has been really interesting has been the material production of fashion. Um, last fall in one of the lectures on Renaissance fashion in Venice, we heard specifically about the lace workshops and the labor practices of the lace workshops. Um, for our last lecture, we heard about Rosa Giannoni and how um, her involvement with feminist and socialist movements brought her into contact with uh, women factory workers in Milan. So I was wondering if you would like to say anything about the material conditions of production today and if you feel that there's continuity with these same problems of the past um, or if you feel it's different or how. Or yeah. Well, we can say that on average, uh, of course, conditions have been definitely uh, improved if compared to the past, but unfortunately just in some parts of our world. Meaning that nowadays it's a very social conscious industry, but this has to take into account country boundaries. Meaning that uh, if you are considering uh, European fashion systems, uh, American ones, of course, uh, it's a labor-intensive industry, but that's also an opportunity in which uh, you have a compelling, company, a compelling challenges but companies are uh, managing uh, all the processes in a very fair way. A few days ago, Gucci launched a new campaign for the social sustainability concerning, uh, for example, the production uh, uh, in some of uh, their markets. On the other side, there are, even nowadays, in particular countries, conditions that definitely are not deserving the, uh, I mean, uh, the attention, a uh, sufficient attention, first of all, by local policy makers, uh, but also by some companies. This typically uh, is related to fast fashion uh, companies that do propose uh, very affordable products uh, typically created in uh, low level cost countries in which there is no sufficient attention by in particular policy maker but another issue concern also the nature of the product itself uh, that is not sustainable if we encourage for example fast fashion we do encourage a kind of uh, life cycle of the product that is very short because typically is associated to buying something very affordable, use, for, use it for a very short period, throwing away and buying a substitute product. While on the other side, if you look at, uh, for example, luxury products, uh, they are designed for lasting, I don't wanna say forever, but uh, for an amount of time that is definitely higher. This has a huge impact in terms, for example, of wastes and the sustainabilities as well, uh, because when we are talking about uh, fashion products, we are not talking just about uh, if the, the cotton is organic or not. Yes, it's one of the elements. But if we encourage this kind of consumption, definitely this could be a, a negative aspect for our planet too. Thank you. There are no questions. It's a tough question, meaning that, of course, we don't know exactly. However, what we know is that in the case of Chanel, the creative direction has been assigned to the personal assistant uh, of her Lagerfeld that she was involved in the collection uh, in the collection development. So basically, in the case of Chanel, uh, I personally would say that uh, I can't foresee any particular disruptive change because the intention of uh, the shareholder was the one of preserving uh, the work of uh, Karl Lagerfeld, uh, 
giving uh, this importance to uh, the assistant that instead of relying on external designers so hiring maybe a very important name from outside the company they did prefer to rely on her so probably I wouldn't see disruptive change and a sort of continuity in the legacy of uh, Karl Lagerfeld. Other specific questions? Regarding the Italian brands that you see like uh, in the short term, in the short long term disruptive effect from changing in the uh, management, uh, from changing of designers, and uh, you know, to pass along to new generation? Well, disruptive change is a uh, strategy that recently has been adopted by several brands uh, for one main reason uh, they must be appealing for a younger generation of customers typically the younger generation uh, millennials but the new generation Z uh, doesn't know very well for example stylistic codes and the legacy of very old or even not so old brands that's a problem from one side because uh, they can't recognize the value out of that symbols and their stylistic identity but on the other side it's an opportunity for creating something new so when we are in front of these changes we have always to consider that they have been <coughs> carefully designed for stating uh, well we must address a new part of the market nowadays millennials account for most of uh, the purchases in particular in the luxury segment and that's the reason why brands are going into that direction are there questions so maybe we ca you can <laughs> talk yes, about the I Milano will show Fashion you, Institute yeah. I will show you a clip concerning uh, one of our masters that make understand uh, the link between education as we were saying and multidisciplinarity of uh, the approach that companies are requiring. focus centered on the relationship between branding and product from the fashion design and the management perspectives. <laughs> Our master has a unique recipe, design, plus management, plus communication. All that learning dynamics will be running Milan, recognized as the world capital for fashion and design. An inclusive environment, an international campus, plus high-tech donation and digital study kit. Traditional disciplinary boundaries are erased for enhancing an innovative, multidisciplinary center of academic excellence. Master structure and contents, warm-up and tools courses, instrumental and basic training on tools, software, and applications. Fashion pillars to understand the DNA of the fashion industry. Processes. Courses designed around corporate processes on the three functional and professional areas of the master. Fashion practice. Real field projects in partnership with fashion and luxury brands. Study tours. To discover fashion as insiders. Internship for applying what we have learned inside leading Italian and international companies. Master in Brand and Product Management. 60 university credits. 97% of placement rate. Your career. Product manager. To design a fashion product and to manage product development. Junior Brand Manager Assistant To manage a fashion brand and the relation between branding and product Junior Merchandiser To create the right architecture of a fashion collection The 
the Master in Brand and Product Management offers the unique possibility to combine the analytical approach of the management processes to the hands-on methodology of the product design. Design and management to fulfill the request of the fashion industry orientated towards multidisciplinarity. Here you can get them. I think also this can uh, give us like a synthesis or a conclusion, an ideal conclusion for our series this year, which really touched upon many different fields, like from history, culture, to uh, cinema, uh, women's studies, and today uh, we heard a lot of business language. Uh, and um, I think what is fascinating about fashion is really this chemistry this capacity of uh, putting together different fields, of uh, engaging with a in, a in a hybrid platform where many different fields can interact. Um, he didn't stress it enough, but like to put like creative minds and business people in the same room <laughs> and having a dialogue is really an incredible thing. So um, yes. on on this note, uh, I think. This concludes very well our series for the year. I invite you to continue the conversation uh, with Dr. Guerini, either now or uh, if you're interested in the Milano Fashion Institute or you're planning to study abroad at IES, uh, directly in Milan, which is actually much better because you will do it in Italian. And, uh, <laughs> so thank you all for coming, and uh, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you, thank you for being here.